Welcome back to another Token Punch Lunch. Uh, we have a great episode for you. It's a little bit of a truncated episode what with all the holidays. And then uh, we've got Pax Unplug coming up this week. We also have our um, uh, retreats coming up uh, two weeks after Pax. So we are just really strapped for time right now. So uh, it's a little bit of a truncated episode. Everybody's feeling the crunch. But I do have a great episode lined up for you. I've got a double shot of Ambi. She has a regular uh, segment. And she also did a song she sent in as well to kind of help out and elongate the episode a little bit. Uh, but great uh, uh, work on, on both of those. Uh, we also have uh, some Jack Eddy coming in from Rook and Record. We also have... Tim Jeanette back in black. Um, not really. He's not really in black. Well, I think he might be wearing a black t-shirt. I don't know. But uh, that just kind of came out. I don't know why. Uh, we also have uh, Board Game Opinions from over in England. Uh, they're coming up and showing off some uh, Gugong from Essen. And... Uh, uh, the starting tile is, you know, bringing up the caboose there, and there, there's just, there's just a good episode, and it's truncated. But you know what? Short isn't always a bad thing. Uh, sometimes it comes in great packages. Liz is showing off a solo war game from Marcus Aurelius, so go check that out. Let's get to it. I'm just blathering here, right? So uh, let's get down to the business. This is Ambie from Board Game Blitz, and right now it's in the middle of holiday season, so I've been spending a lot of time at family gatherings. So today I'm going to go over some games that I like playing with my family. I have a lot of nieces and nephews that are in the 2-4 to four age range, so Go Away Monster is a game that I've played with most of them. This is a game that children can play even when they're under 2, where they're picking out cardboard shapes from a bag and they're trying to fill out uh, shapes in the little bedroom but some of the shapes are monsters and then they have to say go away monster and throw it across the room. You don't actually have to throw it if you don't want to but it's a lot of fun for the kids and it's actually the first game that I've introduced a lot of people to and they really enjoy it and they always want to play again so <laughs> that's really fun. I also have a lot of cousins who are around my age and Transamerica has been pretty good for that group. Transamerica is a game where you're building routes across the US and each person is trying to connect different cities but the routes are shared by everyone so you can connect it up to someone else's route and try to use the cities they've connected to try to get your cities. It's really quick and easy to learn but it, there's also a lot of strategy so people like playing against each other and it works with non-gamers because it's really easy to learn. I know social deduction games don't work with every family, but in my family they've actually worked really well. We've played games like The Resistance, and lately Deception Murder in Hong Kong has been really good. It plays up to 12 players, so when we have a lot of family together, it works really well. And also, specifically for my family, I have an aunt who doesn't know English very well, but she can read the Chinese text on the cards because in this game there's different clue cards and there's one murderer who everyone else is trying to catch and the murderer has different um, different items that they used to murder and clues and so one person is the forensic scientist who knows the answers and is trying to give clues for everyone else to guess but they have really weird things like kerosene and stuff that someone wouldn't know but because of the Chinese words my aunt can read them which is nice but yeah, that's a lot of fun. You also don't actually need to lie because of the way the clues work. So if someone doesn't like lying, you can still play it. So those are just a couple of the games that I play with my family during the holiday seasons when we get together. But there are lots more and really any game can work with your family depending on what your family likes and how much your family likes to play games. So I hope you all have a great holiday season. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here with another episode of Solo Thrash, a Mary Thrash gaming for those of us who like to play alone. Today I want to talk about the Wars of Marcus Aurelius, which is a solitaire kind of small war game that is designed by Robert Dulesky, and it's published by Holland Spiele. 
So in Wars of Marcus Aurelius, we're going to be reenacting the Marcomannic Wars that defined Marcus Aurelius's military career. So this is this spread of years in the late second century covers the first and second Marcomannic Wars, and everything that happens in this game is thematically related to stuff that was happening in that time period. So it's going to be our job to prevent the Marcomanni the Quadi and the Yaziges from advancing far enough down that they, propose, they, that they pose an actual threat to Rome. But the thing that's going to be tough is that our battle isn't just on this front. We're also going to need to manage Imperium at home. So it, basically, if we don't do well enough in our wars, or if we have too many scandals, which did happen, and there are fun event cards related to this, those moments of Marcus Aurelius' life and career, if we get down to zero Imperium, our own army will turn on us and kill us. Uh, and if we can't get all three tribes to surrender by the end of um, of this year track, so about 180 CE, we are not going to win because Marcus Aurelius died that year and we would have run out of time to score a victory. The battles are determined by die rolls, but my favorite thing about this game is the card play. So every turn the barbarians will draw some events that determine what they're going to do and who's going to attack, and some of those cards are pretty unfortunate for us. And then we as the Romans will also be drawing cards, and we draw more cards in the spring, a little fewer in the summer, and only one in the winter. So a lot of this is about hand management, deploying our resources well, because every card can be played either for um, the event that's on the card, so we could play the Lightning Miracle, or you discard the card in order to wage a battle or to build forts to help keep these Germanic tribes back from Roman territory. So you have to make a lot of decisions about how you want to use the cards you're drawing, how to deploy your resources best to ensure victory. We also do have to worry about some off-map conflicts, which also mimics what was happening during this historical period. So we had these Germanic invasions going on on this part of the map, but there were also other revolts going on in the Western and Eastern empires that we may be called on to deal with over the course of this game. I think my favorite thing about this game is its combination of just sort of interesting light war game play with a real sense of humor about its subject matter. Probably my favorite bad event card in the whole deck is just, is this one, Scandal Faustina. So it just says, oh, Faustina, and we lose one Imperium. While records generally indicate that Faustina and, uh, and Marcus Aurelius were quite close, um, the historian Cassius Dio suggests that she had a lot of affairs she might have ordered a few poisonings, and that when there, a rumor reached Rome that Marcus Aurelius had died in the West, um, that she instigated a rebellion by immediately running to um, one of their former friends and starting up a relationship with him. So all of those events can appear in the game, and so I just I love the attention to Marcus Aurelius's actual life and to historical detail, but in a way that's actually pretty fun. So that is the Wars of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, I actually had to pick this copy up off of BGG because it's currently sold out on the Holland Spiel website, but um, I expect it'll be back into print soon, and if you're a print and play type of gamer, you can actually just buy the PNP files and print off a copy for yourself, which is just as good. So I just want to show off the Wars of Marcus Aurelius. It's historical, it's solitaire, it's fun. Happy gaming. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Cardboard Herald's Rook and Record, where we pick the most perfect and most subjective soundtrack to listen to while playing your favorite games. And today we are here at Kingfisher Canal in Juneau, Alaska to talk to you about Root. Now you may think that Root is a cuddly game, but beneath its cute critter exterior is a hard-boiled world of political intrigue, corruption, and gritty revolution. And so if you are wanting something as hard-boiled, as hardcore, as the Forest of Root, then I'm telling you, you have got to listen to the 1994 classic by the BC Boys, Ill Communication. This is my favorite Beastie Boys album, showcasing the broad range of talents and musical interests that these three have, making one of the most cohesive yet experimental records in their repertoire. Ad rock, MCA, Mike D, play instruments, invoke crazy samples, call upon fantastic guests like Bismarcky, and of course, rap like there is no tomorrow. 
Now like this game, this album is accessible but harsh, sophisticated but intense. It's got this fantastic rhythm that matches the kind of cyclical nature of Root with the birdsong, daylight, evening, birdsong, daylight, evening, by having these wonderful rhythmic bass lines, drums, and yeah, fantastic rhymes throughout the entire thing. And then you round all of that out with the most woodland instrument itself, tons of flute, and y'all know how much I love the flute since the very first episode of Rook and Record that we published. But there's a good old-fashioned New York City style grit, both humorous and hostile, that works perfect for the furry gang wars that you're going to have in this game. Above anything else, both Root and Ill Communication are layered pieces, asynchronous, and drawing on so many dynamic parts that feel like they'd be too fragile to work together. Yes, this is a hip-hop record, but it's also full of funk, jazz, and punk, yet somehow, like the wild factions of Root, it all works in concert, creating something stylish, smart, and completely unique. So you heard it here, folks. If you're getting your Root down, then there is no better soundtrack to your collapsing avian monarchy or your woodland critter sabotage than the Beastie Boys, Ill Communication. Thank you so much for watching. I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald. And remember, the more that we do with these, the less bad music that you will have to suffer at the table.
everyone, this is Tim Jeanette, the Metal Meeple, and this is the Budget Board Game Breakdown. So in this episode, we're going to talk about a game that has tons of replayability, and that is Unusual Suspects by Simon, or at least this version is by Simon. Now, this is one of those games where I know that a lot of people already know about. A lot of people are going to kind of maybe skip this because they don't care about party games. But if you are interested in a game that is cheap as far as product, uh, the cost of it, not actually the components. The components are pretty good. Uh, but also has tons of replayability, and you're not just going to bust out for game nights with the party or like events and things like that. This is a game that we bust out all the time with our core gaming group as, as a later game in the night to kind of settle down, or not really settle down, but at least in the night with, because it is, you know, if you don't have much time to get in a really long game, you can play a few rounds of this and then be like, okay, cool, everybody go home, or whatever. Uh, we were surprised at the fact that we play it multiple times in a row. There's not a lot of games that we do that with. Obviously, longer games you don't, but uh, shorter games you kind of do sometimes. In this case, we typically play it as many times as there are players at the table. That way, everybody has the chance of being witness. Now the games are about 10 to 20 minutes, typically 15 is a good average, um, 10 to 15 is usually what our group does. And if you're not familiar with the game, I wouldn't just immediately pass this up because you might be surprised. Let me just show you how it's played, don't take this as a how to play the game, even though I probably will go over most of the rules anyway. Uh, but basically it's a cooperative game where you're trying to figure out of a grid of people who the actual suspect or the guilty party is. Now, one player is going to be the witness, they're going to have one of these cards, they'll flip over, and it shows you which position is the guilty party. In this case, it is this dude right here, and you're trying to convey this to the rest of the investigators, which is the rest of the players at the table. The only um, problem is you can't speak, you can't gesture, you can't say anything, all you can do is use these two cards. <clears throat> and the way you're going to use these two cards is the beginning of each round, the other players will flip one of these cards here. These are questions. You can see there's tons of them. They'll flip one over and it'll have a question. Do they have a record player? And as the witness, you have to decide if this guy here has a record player. But all you can do is use these two cards. You either say, yes, he does. And no, he does not. And you're going to place this next to the question card and let the conversation ensue. Now what the other players are going to do is talk amongst themselves and start flipping cards face down. Each round they must at least flip one card face down. So let's just say you, you maybe for some reason you thought this guy does not have a record player. That means that the rest of the team or the rest of the investigators will have to flip over people that do have a record player because they don't want to flip over somebody who does not. Now obviously maybe they take this person and they think, well she's kind of elderly, maybe she has a record player from uh, her, you know, you know, the type of music she listened to predominantly was on record at the time. So she would have a record player, but the suspect does not. So let's flip her down. Each round you must at least do one card, but you can do as many as you want. The reason you want to do more is because you're going to be scored based on the time. So in round one, times how many cards you flip down equals the time spent. So if you flip down three, you would get three. But if you flip down three in round six, you would get 18 points. The lower the score wins. So obviously you want to try to do it as fast as possible, but at any time if you flip over the suspect or the, uh, the guilty party, the players immediately lose. There is no flipping it back over. So once a card's flipped face down, no matter if somebody jumped the gun in the conversation or what, uh, that card is face down for better or for worse. And once the players are done, say they went like this, for whatever reason, they're like, you know what, we don't really know for sure the rest of the people that's in that round. You would do scoring and then flip over the next card. Do they like children? Who knows? So you're going to talk about that over and over. And, you know, each game you're only going to play with these 12. Then we like <clears throat> we like to shuffle them all up and deal out another 12. That way we always have some of the same guys sometimes or girls or whatever. And uh, you would just do this over and over until you pick the right guy or whatever. Or you lose. There's a team variant in which case you would have the same setup. And then one team would come into the room, do it. And the next team comes in and do it. I have yet to try that, but it does sound kind of fun, especially in a party environment. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll try that soon. If you've tried that, let me know what you think of it. It seems like it would only work if you have uh, other stuff going on in the house. But anyway, I like this game. I'm glad I picked it up in the math trade. I actually probably wish I would have picked it up sooner, even at, uh, I think it was maybe released at Gen Con the year before. I can't remember for sure, but it is a fun game. 
I like deep games, I like fun games, I like light games, whatever. Uh, this one just struck me, and it's really funny. Sometimes you do have to have the right people in order to play it. Uh, you know, obviously, you, you want to know the people that you're playing with to see. There are some boundaries, etc., but you, you can figure that out on your own. So, anyway, if you got any fun stories about unusual suspects, post them below. I'd like to hear from you. If you have any other games that are similar, also note those below, too, for all of the rest of us to check out. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at timjanet at gmail.com. Follow me on social media at the handle below. Check out my podcast, Meeple Corn. And until next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. Hello, fellow Token Punch Launchers. This is Pavel from Geek Factor Poland speaking. Now, this is a uh, bit of a weird segment for me today because I wanted to film something completely different. I had a plan to film something completely different. I may still film it, but you will see it in like two weeks. But now I have to film this. Uh, now, the reason I'm filming this, I have to film this, is because this is quite some of the biggest news I've heard this year when it comes to the world of board gaming, especially the board gaming scene in Poland, but this is an event from the board gaming scene in, in Poland that has the a global it's gonna have global consequences. So I think it's might it might be something you might be interested in. Now in front of me I have two boxes. Now Dice Settlers and Escape Tales the Awakening. The reasons I have the reason I have those top those two boxes in front of me is because the companies responsible for those two games, both of these games uh, have uh, are available since have been available since the this year. And SKN Games and Board and Dice, those companies have decided to merge to merge. Sorry, yeah, it's a full on merger. It's not a overtaking. It's not a aggressive whatever the word the name is the hostile takeover no it's not it's not any of that it's just two companies with really strong board games board game titles in their portfolio who have been friendly for a long time deciding to work together as a single entity now as i said this is quite a big this is quite a big news you know because those both those companies i mean board and dice is 100% is a 100% polish company and SKN Games is part Polish, part Romanian, but a lot of the uh, creative work, a lot of the marketing work, a lot of the logistic work, a lot of that happens in Poland. So this is why we kind of, here in Poland, we kind of treat NSKN as also a Polish, at least in part, uh, well, it is a Polish in part, but we kind of think of it as a Polish publisher, even though it is Polish-Romanian. And now they're going to be one, one thing, one entity. The name is going to be Board and Dice. They're going with the name Board and Dice, not because there there is no financial reason behind it. There is no, from what I can tell, at least, uh, there is no, uh, uh, I don't know what to say, like like a power play reason behind it. No, this is just the fact that board and dice has a better ring to it when you think about it. It's easier to market it overseas. So this is the reason why we're going with the name board and dice. Now they changed the logo to the thing you can see right here. This is their brand new logo. Now, the reason I am excited about this is because, like I said, those two companies have amazing titles in their portfolio. I said that. Now, Dice Settlers, uh, Mistfall, Simurg, In the Name of Odin, a bunch of other cool games, uh, Teotihuacan, I haven't played that one yet, but I've, everyone I've, I've heard, every, everyone I've heard uh, who has played it said it's amazing. Board and Dice, the same. I mean, Multi-Universum is one of my all-time favorite small games. It's uh, in between. It's uh, the Escape Tales, the Awakening, one of the best games of the year. So, when those two, when two companies like that merge, it can only mean one thing: better, like better, bigger, better prepared. Uh, all those words come to mind because I I know for a fact that the people behind those two companies they are real good friends in real life. So that means that they would not they wouldn't make this decision if it wasn't for any other reason but to bring you more and better looking, more interesting products for this year, well, I mean for the year 2019 and for all future years. So those, all the brains behind those two companies, I just, I can't wait. They already had, they make, uh, their, they made an announcement, so you can go to their fan, page and, uh, fan pages on Facebook, you can see the announcement. They also announced a little bit of what they're planning for 2019 in terms of publishing. 
and uh, I just I can't wait. I can't wait what they're gonna bring. I'm really excited for it. I'm really rooting for them. I also know the people behind those uh, publishers. I also consider them friends, and uh, I'm really excited. This is really big news, and this can only mean something good for us. And I'm like I said, I simply can't wait to see what's gonna come out of this. So uh, I hope you found this bit of news interesting. This is straight from Poland. NSKN Games, Bored and Dice merging to be one big publishing company, Bored and Dice. That's right. Watch out, Asmodee. We got a new sheriff in town. That was lame. I'm really sorry about that one. <laughs> thank you for having. Uh, thank you for watching me, guys. Thanks Sam for having me on as part of the, the Token Punch Lunch. And I hope I see you soon. See you in two weeks. Bye bye. Hi, welcome to Board Game Opinions. My name's Steve Rain. I'm Jonathan Hicks. And I'm Mark Windle. And our flavour of the month this month is Goo Gong, I think is how you say it. Jonathan brought it back from Essen and we've played it quite a lot since he did. Uh, Goo Gong is a point salad through and through. You get points for loads of different things, but it's really tight and, and a lot of thinky game going on here. The premise of Goo Gong is effectively you've got these cards in your hand and they have numbers from 1 through 9. And on your turn there are 7 action spots in the middle. You take one of the cards in your hand, for example I could take this 5, and I could place it over very low in numbered on the board on the board to take the spot of that spot. So here I could say, well there's a three there, I can play the five where the three was. The three would take part of my hand next turn, so it would go in a face down pile on my next turn. I will draw the cards I've kind of displaced this turn. And I will take some actions. I will take the action of the spot I go to, but before I do that the cards have actions on themselves. Some of the things, uh, uh, there are loads of different things you can do on the board, but some of those things, for example, you can go here and try and build the Great Wall. It's themed in uh, China, if you didn't get to guess from the name. Um, but basically, you go here, you try and build the Great Wall, you can either add one of your workers, to take part in the Great Wall, he just stands there and wall, it acts like a wall, or you can kind of discard a worker to put two workers there, and you're going to get points when the Great Wall finishes, the person who's got the most there is going to score points and various bits and bobs. Um, you could go to the Jade Merchant, if you go to a spot where the Jade Merchant is, you can buy some Jade, Jade's really hard to get throughout the course of the game, effectively you spend workers to get Jade, and there are other ways to get Jade, but at the end of the game you kind of get 1 and 3 and 6 and 10 and 15 points for how much Jade you've got, so that's a really good way of trying to get points at the end of the game. Um, but one of the most key Key spots in the game is this central spot here. Uh, you can effectively is it your envoy is kind of going up to meet the emperor and get to the top spot, and you can go to this spot here move your envoy up one or two spaces depending on how much stuff you spend um, and get to the top. The first person who gets to the top is going to get some points but if you don't get to the top your end game score is zero. You cannot win the game um, which is really unique in the game. You can go travelling, picking up little bits here, you can go shipping and kind of send your ship down and the further your ship goes and when it gets full effectively you can claim it for a bonus action and there's loads more going on that I can't fit in such a short video. <laughs> um, but we've played it quite a bit, what do we think guys? I think it's fantastic. It is a really good game, but it's one of those where you've just got so many options and there's so much to think about on your turn because for each of the different spots, you know, if you've got one card in your hand, you're looking at the card, potentially the action on that card, so oh, I really want this action, well, but where do I take it? Which space do I go to? And then not only that, you're thinking if I pick up one of these cards for next turn, how good is the number? Because you always need to play a higher number than the card that's already there. Once you get right to the top to the nine, you can play a one on top of the nine, so it kind of cycles around. But that decision of where do I want to play, where can I play, given the cards I've got, and how do I combine the actions in the best way to score me the most points, there's just so much to think about. Yeah, the ROM mechanism is great. I also like that the cards have double actions on them, so sometimes I can like taking a card in one place to take an action, but first I get to take an action over here, so I, you, you're picking your cards based on, well, where would I like two actions next turn as well? Mm. I really like the uh, games like this where the tie for like everything is decided by a track, so you're going up this, you're getting better, you decide ties, it's not just by, based on some random them game me mechanism you can make yourself win ties and you also spend those points on other things to help you I like that all the actions often have a double action so as Steve said I can do a, a cheap one or I can do a more expensive one to push myself further forward so I've got more to think about there's just so much going on it all works really well together uh, workers are a key in the game so basically you're spending your workers from a pool and you claim back some workers at the end of each round there are various ways on the board to gain back workers but like Mark says those double actions need more workers to do so effectively um, I need two workers to do this action or I can do the top action for free. Well, the, the action you need two workers for is way better and so you're trying to kind of manipulate the workers and the cards you've got because you can get more cards as the game goes on. Um, we haven't scratched a surface in this four minute no. video but you can see clearly we really like this game. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to play it and you like your heavy euros where you get points for everything, uh, try Goo Gong. It's great. Cracking.
folks, welcome to another Token Punch Lunch episode of the Starting Tile. Hope you're enjoying whatever it is you're eating. I, for one, could do the sandwich <laughs> right about now. <clears throat> Sorry about my throat, having a little bit of a head cold thing that, at the moment, so if my voice sounds a bit weird, that's why. So, this is continuing my uh, sort of like top tips for teaching gateway gamers how to get into the hobby. I've already covered theme, I've covered types of games. Now I want you to think hard about the player count. Now, you want to get into this situation where it's like, oh yeah, I want to teach as many people as I can. You know, I want, I want all eight of my friends around and I can teach them in one go how to get into games. Yeah, be a little bit careful with that because one thing you've got to bear in mind is that not all games that can cater for that many players are good gateway games in the first place. Secondly, they'll generally be party games if they can handle that many players. So it's not like necessarily indicative of the hobby if you're going to be playing something like Time's Up with everyone. It's like, yeah, it's a modernish board game, but it's still a party game. It's not really emphasizing what the hobby can, you know, encompass, what can it do. And thirdly, it's what sometimes these games can get out of hand when you teach too many players. Think um, Seven Wonders. I mean, I don't think it's a gateway game, but some people do. Regardless of that, let's say you are teaching Seven Wonders as a gateway game. Would you prefer to teach it to two or three new players, or six or seven? Because Seven Wonders, as you probably know, gets very, <laughs> shall we say, a bit more complex, a bit more fiddly the more players you add. Yes, it's simultaneous, but you've got to look after six different people or so in order to say, right, you do this, you know, all right, you've got this card, that means this, have you done your resources? You know, you've got to look after a lot of people. And not only is that hard for them to take in because they're not getting the, the personal one-to-one -one, um, sort of teaching style that they probably need, but you're also maybe not enjoying the game as much yourself because you're spending more time dealing with the admin of other players than you are actually enjoying the game yourself. I taught Seven Wonders the other week to two new players, even had an expansion in it, but it was only four of us. There was only two new players. It was a lot easier to be able to just look at those two players and give them one-to-one -one teaching. The other person knew what he was doing, I knew what I was doing, I could still focus on my turn, but if somebody said, um, can I play this card? I'm not entirely sure. I could at least talk to them face to face. When you've got too many players, it's hard to do that. Think of the difference between, let's say you go to university and you go to a lecture and a seminar for your subject. Which is easier for you to really get to grips with the knowledge you're trying to learn? A lecture or a seminar? It differs between people. For me, it's a seminar. The lecture is you and about 100 other people sat listening to a guy talk. The seminar is you and maybe nine other people just getting that intimate conversation between the teacher and a select group of you. The seminar just for me works a lot better on a teaching front. Now there are exceptions to this rule. Camel Up is a fantastic gateway game if you want to teach people just a light zany racing game. And it can go up to eight players now at the second edition. And it works fine at eight players. I have taught Camel Up to six or seven new players at once and it's worked fine. But that is an exception to the rule. There are some games like that that are just wonderfully designed for that. But that one is simple. You're not waiting long time for your turn. The admin is not particularly intrusive in it. So those ones work, but honestly, you just need to be careful about wanting to teach too many players at once. A lot of these gateway games will naturally work better with less players, just because you want that intimate style of teaching. I've taught Baron Park to loads of people, I've taught uh, Shadows of a Camelot, I have done Seven Wonders before, Dominion, um, trying to think of others, Flam Rouge. Flam Rouge, actually, I would say racing games. If you want to teach a lot of people a gateway game quickly, then racing games are the way to go. They don't have as much admin, Flam Rouge, Camel Up, uh, Downforce. They have very few rules and everybody understands racing. So if you want to take something away and you want to teach a lot of players, go racing. Otherwise, I suggest keeping the player count as minimal as you can, if you can help it. So that's another episode of the Starting Tile Token Punch Lunch Edition, <laughs> as you might call it. I'll see you on the next episode. And remember, no matter how many people you're teaching, whatever you're comfortable with, just remember and remind them it's still only a game. Take care, enjoy your lunch, and I'll see you next time. 
So that's that for another episode of Token Punch Lunch. Did I tell you or did I tell you? My segment contributors are really just knocking it out of the park, and I'm really, really thankful for all the work that they've put in uh, to the show, and I certainly appreciate everything they do. We thank you for stopping by and taking a gander at the content that we're creating for you. So uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. We hope you found it informative, entertaining, uh, all that good stuff. If you have some comments or pointers for us, keep it constructive, but uh, by all means, let us know in the comments section, and we'll certainly appreciate that communication as well. Well, we're going to go ahead and get on out of here, let you get back to the rest of your day. We thank you. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. We'll see you guys and gals on the flip side. Take care now. Fatality.